Good afternoon. This is one of my favorite lectures. I love them all, but this is one of my favorite because it's a great story. It's the story of transformation and oncogenesis. If you have any Ralph Waldo Emerson fans here, this is perfect description, and you will understand it at the end, I hope. Let's start with an experiment. Uh, we are going to take a hamster embryo and remove the legs and the head because they have too much bone in them. And then we're going to take the rest of the embryo and chop it up and digest it with trypsin until we get single cells. And this is a common way to make cell cultures. And we're going to plate those cells in a dish and watch them grow. If we looked at the dish of cells under the microscope, we could see that the cells look normal. But if we continue to grow them, and say the cells reach confluence and we split them and pass them, we could only do that for about 30 passages. And then the cells would die. And that's reflected in the graph here. Here we have cell growth rate with days after culture. These, the viability of these cultures, again, these are primary cells from the hamster embryo. It, reduces, it goes down to near zero. But then there is a rise in the growth again after the cells go through what we call a crisis. And then there appear some cells that are immortal, which will live forever. This happens spontaneously in some cell cultures, in some primary cell cultures. And if you look at these cells under the microscope here, on the left is our normal monolayer of cells that we first plated out, but these died off and were replaced by transformed cells, which you can see look very different in ways which we'll discuss in a moment, and they all pile up on each other. You could accelerate this process by taking these cells from the hamster and treating them with something that would induce mutations, a chemical, a mutagen, or ultraviolet light. And then when you plate them out, you will see immediately some cells growing out into what we call transformed foci. So you can accelerate this crisis period by mutagenesis. What's happened in both cases is that the cells have sustained mutations in their genome, either spontaneously when we just pass the cells and they go through crisis, or by treating them with a mutagen. And those mutations make the cells live forever. It makes them immortal. And those cells we call transformed cells, and the process by which they go from having a finite life and apparently normal appearances is called transformation. This property was discovered many years ago when people first started to try and grow cell cultures in the laboratory. And these transformed cells have a lot of properties that are different from normal cells. And what do I mean by normal cells? You take an embryo and you make a primary cell culture. Those have normal properties. They're not immortal, but these cells that are transformed, like HeLa cells, they're immortal. Of course, HeLa cells were taken from the tumor of a woman in 1951. She had a cervical tumor, and that tumor was a virus-transformed tumor which we're going to talk about today, how viruses do that. And so those cells, li cells live forever. By the way, you don't have to use an embryo. You could take primary cells from other sources as well. Transformed cells don't have anchorage dependence anymore. They don't need to be attached to a monolayer to grow. Most primary cells like to be attached to a monolayer. Uh, these transformed cells tend to pile up on one another. And in fact, they can even grow in, in liquid. They don't have contact inhibition. Normal cells, when they touch each other, they stop growing. Transformed cells pile up on, on top of one another, as you can see in panel B. They will make colonies in semi-solid media. What does that mean? You take some agar, and you mix cells, and then you put it in a plate, and it solidifies. So now you have single cells suspended in the agar. A transformed cell will grow. A non-transformed, a normal cell will not, because it needs growth factors produced by its neighbors. So these transformed cells have decreased requirements for growth factors, which we typically give them in serum. That's why one of the reasons you put serum on cell cultures is because it's full of growth factors that the cells require. And primary cells have a higher requirement for serum than do transformed cells because of this transformation property. So that's what transformation is. It is different from oncogenesis. Oncogenesis is the development of cancer. The development of cancer is different from transformation. And of course, a cancer can lead to a tumor, which is a swelling of tissue caused by abnormal growth. 
can have benign tumors that remain in place or malignant ones that metastasize. And this is a genetic disease. We have finally learned that after many years of research. Cancer is a genetic disease, about 8 million deaths per year in developed countries. Why don't I have uh, underdeveloped countries here? We just don't have good statistics. We can't get out and measure the death rate for specific diseases. So that's higher in the rest of the world. What causes cancer? I said it's a genetic mutation. About a dozen mutations uh, that affect signal proteins in signal transduction pathways governing cell proliferation, survival, cell fate, and the maintenance of genome integrity. We need mutations in multiple genes encoding multiple proteins involved in these processes. And we know this because we are now sequencing the genome of people's tumors and we can see the mutations that are in them and try and get a consensus from type of tumor to type of tumor. About a dozen mutations. And these mutations, you can inherit them from your parents. You can get them from DNA damage. If you're in the sun too long, you get skin cancer, environmental carcinogens, and infectious agents, including viruses, and some of which we'll talk about today. So you might inherit from your parents 10 of the 12 mutations, and then at some point you, you get an insult, UV light, a chemical carcinogen, you get the other two, and boom, you have cancer. Or you may inherit all 12 of them and die in utero. So we think about 12, maybe a little more. But that's the concept I want you to keep with you. And here's a little tease. When cells divide incessantly, the consequence is mutation. Most of your cells in your body do not divide constantly, and that's good. That way they don't sustain mutations. You know, one of the fastest dividing cells is in your intestine, lining your intestine, but they, they slough off every few days. They're gone, and then they're replaced by new ones. And the same with your skin. The, the upper layers divide and then die and fall off. If other cells in your body kept dividing, you know, with each cell division, you sustain mutations. The number is amazing. I, I can't remember what it is now. We sustain thousands of mutations a day, and our repair system takes care of most of them, but some slip by. So today we're going to talk about uh, the, the involvement of viruses in this. So I want you to remember that transformation and oncogenesis are distinct. Transformation is simply a cell that divides forever and is immortal. We talked about this in, in terms of the hamster cells. It may or may not be oncogenic. How would you know? You could inject it into a mouse. Here's a nude mouse, and we have injected into it a human tumor cell line, and there you see a tumor has formed. And so clearly that transformed cell line is oncogenic. We use nude mice, by the way, otherwise they'd reject the cells, and you'd never be able to uh, do the experiment. They don't have an immune system. So transformed cells simply grow forever. Eventually, they may sustain enough mutations to become oncogenic, in which case they are cancerous. And this whole idea, the relationship between transformation and oncogenesis, the molecular relationship, was all revealed by studying viruses. And that's the story I am going to tell you today. No virus can do it all. We say viruses cause cancer, but they actually don't. What they do is make cells divide forever. They make cells immortal. And eventually the cell takes it the rest of the way. It sustains mutations, and that makes the cell cancerous. In fact, that's pretty much how all cancers arise. Eventually the cell sustains enough mutations. In many cases, viruses, as we'll see for HIV, the continuous reproduction of virus makes cytokines be produced continuously. Many cytokines are mitogenic. They cause cells to divide. Cells divide and divide and divide, and eventually they become tumors because they sustain the mutations. There's no magic about it. It's all about having enough mutations to cause a tumor. Viruses are thought to be the contributing factor in about 20% of human cancers, and the main viruses that do this are shown here. You can see uh, a number of herpes viruses. We have Epstein-Barr virus, we have Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. We have, uh, okay, so those are the two herpes viruses. Then we have some hepatitis viruses, a few retroviruses, papillomavirus, and a polyomavirus. And these are the cancers that these cause. We're not going to talk about any of these today. These are all are different mechanisms. 
and what I want to do today is talk about how we learned how cells become transformed and they lead to cancer. We will touch a little bit about, on later on how HIV uh, causes cancers, but the mechanisms uh, all, in all of these involved transforming cells, and they're all slightly different for each virus. Uh, but today we're going to talk about how we learned uh, this whole story. I want you to understand at the onset that transformation in oncogenesis is not required for the replication of any asterisk virus. I used to say this all the time in this course uh, because no virus has to make a tumor in order to replicate. It's an accident, as you will see. And then I got an email one year from someone who studies a tumor in a fish caused by a virus, and that's apparently the one exception we know about. In biology, there are always exceptions, and you just wait until the day when it's proven. We'll get to that later. I'll talk about that. But for the most part, all these human viruses, they don't have to cause cancers in order to replicate and find a new host. All right, this story begins on October 1st, 1909, not too far from here. It was at the time the Rockefeller Medical Institute. And a scientist, a doctor, Dr. Peyton Rouse, he was studying solid tumors in chickens. In fact, the story goes that a farmer from New Jersey brought him a chicken like this one with a solid tumor on it. And uh, Rouse was interested in understanding what caused this tumor. And he would uh, take off the tumor and grind it up, filter it through a small pore filter. Remember, 1909 viruses had already been defined as small agents that passed through a filter. And then he would inject the filtrate into a new chicken. And voila, one day he found that this uh, caused the tumor to develop in another chicken. So a virus could cause this <coughs> tumor on a chicken. First time this had been found. Actually not. In 1908, a leukemia virus had been identified, but at the time no one thought that those were cancers because they weren't solid. We now know otherwise, but uh, at the time, 1909, the first virus to cause a tumor identified by Peyton Rouse. Nobody believed him. It took 50 years for this to percolate through the scientific community, and in 1966, he got a Nobel Prize for this discovery. This is the longest incubation period ever for a Nobel Prize. And the reason is that people were arguing about what caused cancers in the ensuing years, and I'll try and give you a flavor for that today. So the virus he discovered was called Rouse sarcoma virus. So he got a Nobel Prize for showing that this caused cancers in chickens. And two other Nobel Prizes were awarded subsequently for work on the same virus as well. We've, also, we've already talked about one, the discovery of reverse transcriptase in Rouse sarcoma virus by Baltimore and Temin. So that's the second Nobel. We'll talk about the third uh, in a moment. Now, if you have any of you read The uh, Emperor of All Maladies? Just two people. This is a great book. Siddhartha Mukherjee got a Pulitzer Prize for it. He is an oncologist at Columbia. He's a colleague of mine, but he doesn't answer my emails, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> But this is a lovely book. It's his best book for sure. And it tells the history of cancer in a beautiful way. So I want to set this story up for you by quoting a little bit from this book. Uh, by the 1950s, cancer researchers had split into three feuding camps. The virologists led by Rouse claimed that viruses cause cancer, although no such virus had been found in human studies. Epidemiologists argue that exogenous chemicals cause cancer, although they could not afford a mechanistic explanation. The third camp possessed weak circumstantial evidence that genes internal to the cell might cause cancer. They were all right in the end, and I hope to show you how they were today. But of course, initially they were all feuding because each one thought its story was right. Enter in 1951, Howard Temin. He is a young virologist, he goes to do a postdoc with Renato Del Becco at Caltech. And he goes there to study fruit flies, but he gets tired of them. Lovely, uh, restless and imaginative. He soon grew bored with fruit flies, which is hard to do because they're amazing in, in their own. But he chose to study Rouse sarcoma virus. 
So remember, Dobeko developed the plaque assay for animal viruses. Dobeko realized at the end of the 40s that cell culture was going to transform virology. So he jumped on it. He made a plaque assay. And then he said, let's study Rouse sarcoma virus. Up until this point, people had been injecting the virus into chickens over and over again and not getting anywhere, because there's only so much you can do with a chicken besides eat it. <laughs> and in Dobeko's lab, he said, why don't I use chicken cells to study this virus? And so he imagined creating cancer in a Petri dish. After seven years, he succeeded. Uh, what he did, he took Rouse sarcoma virus, grown up in a chicken, he added it to a layer of normal cells. These were chicken cells prepared from chicken embryos, very much like the embryo cells we talked about earlier made from hamsters. The infection incited them to grow uncontrollably, forcing them to form tiny distorted heaps, which he called foci. He reasoned these represented cancer distilled into its essential form, cells growing uncontrollably. This is not cancer. This is a little bit of artistic license of Mukherjee. These are transformed cells. As I told you in the beginning, they are not yet cancers. Other things have to happen before they're cancerous cells. But what he saw under the microscope is shown here. Here are monolayers of chicken cells infected with Rouse sarcoma virus. And you can see the foci of cells that are transformed. They're slightly different from the other cells. They're piling up. They're growing over one another. Uh, and they form different morphologies. Sometimes they can be round. Sometimes they can be spindle-shaped. But they are immortal. Infection with Rouse sarcoma virus has immortalized these cells. And this in essence, is the beginning of the road to our understanding of how, how viruses cause transformation of cells and eventually cancer. Really, you could argue it begins in 1909 with Rouse's discovery of this virus. Other milestones in the history of transformation, which I'm going to touch on today, in 1962, baby hamster kidney cells were shown to be transformed after they were infected with a polyoma virus. And in 1964, SV40, remember, that's the virus we've talked about so much in terms of molecular biology. That was shown to transform mouse cells. Most of the cells died, but some did not. Rare cells did not. And those were transformants that grew forever. So we have RNA and DNA viruses both transforming cells and making them immortal. And that's the story we're going to follow today to understand how the viruses do that. So how can a viral infection result in transformation of the cell. Well, first requirement is that cytopathic effects have to be either reduced or eliminated. Remember, cytopathic effects are the virus killing the cell. And of course, for a cell to live forever, it can't die. So that's obvious. You have to suppress cytopathic effects. You have to re reduce the production of virus, because we know that more virus production is associated with cell death. And the cell has to continue to divide, and that's what we mean by immortal. So these are the three requirements for a virus infection to transform a cell. I have a little bell here to ask you, does that ring a bell? Last time, we talked about persistent infections. These are exactly the things that happen in persistent infections. So in fact, transformation of cells is in many ways like a persistent infection. So our first question is, which of the following is not a property of transformed cells? Increased requirements for growth factors, immortality, loss of anchorage dependence, loss of contact inhibition, or colony formation in semi-solid media? Well, most of you got A, which is the right answer. Increased requirements for growth factors. Decreased requirements is a, is a property of transformed cells. So that's not a property. Well, the others are immortality, loss of anchorage independence, dependence, loss of contact inhibition, colony formation. Those are all properties of transformed cells. So here's the story we're going to go through today. This is the route that we went through historically to understand how viruses transform cells and the relationship to cancer. We have retroviruses, which we've talked a little bit about, discovered in the 1900s. Temin begins to work on this problem in 1950s. We have DNA viruses discovered in the 20s and in the 50s shown to cause tumors in animals. And these are going to converge in the 60s and 70s, along with studies on cancer biology in vitro. And all of it's going to come together 
And it's all going to become clear in retrospect how these things uh, result in transformation because they are going to be involved in cell growth control. So let's start with the retroviruses. Again, we've got Rouse discovering his virus in 1909. Temin starts to work out in the 1950s. First, we have to go back to 1908 when Ellerman and Bang discover a virus called avian leukosis virus, ALV. They discovered this as causing leukemia in chickens. Now, perhaps you didn't know this, but most chickens in the world are infected with this virus, ALV, within a few months of their hatching. Now, the virus, the, the, the chickens that you eat, the broilers, they're, they're sacrificed relatively quickly once they get to a good size, so they may never get infected. But the, the uh, chickens that lay eggs, they're kept for a long time, so they become infected. And leukemia develops in uh, infected birds, about 3% of them over 14 weeks of age. So most of the birds get infected with the virus. A small fraction get leukemia. 97% of the birds have a transient viremia uh, and get immune, and they don't get leukemia. So only a small fraction get leukemia. Uh, and then, as these birds age, the infected birds, other cancers begin to show up, and these include connective tissue tumors, which is a sarcoma, or solid tumor, and that's what uh, Rouse was studying on the side of a bird. So this was a tumor that originated in a bird that had been originally infected with avian leukosis virus. If you get viruses from these tumors, which is what Rouse did, and you put them into new chickens, they cause sarcomas, not leukemias. Ellerman and Bang showed that you could get virus from the blood of these young chickens who were infected at an early age who had leukemia and transmit leukemia to another chicken. But these viruses from the solid tumors only cause sarcomas. And that's one of the viruses that Rouse isolated. He called it Rouse sarcoma virus because he put his name there and uh, it caused a sarcoma, of course. And as you will see in a moment, most of these sarcoma viruses are defective. You can look at tumors in different chickens and identify different kinds of sarcoma viruses. And Rouse was really lucky because he got one that was not defective. And you'll see what that means in a moment. Now, so we're left with the fact that Rouse sarcoma virus, but not ALV, causes sarcomas. Why not? So starting with the work of Temin, others began to study this in the 60s and 70s. And the key findings was that the viral genomes from the solid tumors were recombinants. They are recombinants in, in the sense that a piece of the ALV genome, so Rouse sarcoma virus is basically ALV, where a piece of the genome is replaced with a segment of host DNA. In fact, with Rouse, the segment is in addition to the genome. But for most of the other sarcoma viruses that have been isolated, the cell gene replaces a viral gene, and it makes them defective. Rouse's wasn't defective, and that's why he was lucky. The gene that's replaced uh, from the host that comes in is called an oncogene because it leads to cancers, as you will see. And this was all sorted out in a number of laboratories. The Nobel Prize was given to these two individuals in 1989, Mike Bishop and Harold Varmas. They were both at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco at the time. And they did the work identifying in Rouse sarcoma virus the cellular DNA, the oncogene, which they called VSARC, that allows it to transform cells. Harold Varmus is an amazing guy. We interviewed him on TWIV 400. He was a professor for many years at UCSF. Then he became the head of the NIH during the Clinton administration. Then he came here to New York, and he was president of Sloan Kettering. And now he's a researcher at Sloan Kettering. And he rides his bike all over New York. And he was an English major. So there you go. If you're an English major, you could still do, get a Nobel Prize in science. So this was an amazing discovery uh, that clarified just how Rouse sarcoma virus transformed cells. So the insight here is that birds get a variety of tumors a while after being infected with ALV. The tumors have retroviruses that are derived from ALV, but most of them are defective and they're all different. They all have different pieces of host DNA. And as I said, Rouse was lucky. His isolate was not defective. I'll show you a picture of it in a moment to clarify that. 
And as people did this, they took chickens with different tumors and isolated different viruses, they kept getting different oncogenes in these viruses. Each solid tumor had different host DNA and not the SARC gene that was found in Rouse sarcoma virus. Each DNA had a novel chicken oncogene, and for molecular oncology, this was a gold mine because they were isolating all of these cell genes that could somehow participate in cell transformation. So here are some of the viruses that were identified in these studied. So these are called transducing retroviruses because they're picking up a piece of cellular DNA, putting it in their genome, and they're bringing it to a new cell. It's a process called transduction. So on the left are the avian transducing retroviruses. You'll recognize the common retroviral gene order, gag, Paul envelope. This is avian leukosis virus, the progenitor of all these solid tumor viruses. And here's Rouse sarcoma virus. You can see it's got gag, Paul, and envelope, and it's got an extra sequence inserted at the end. It's the SARC gene. It doesn't lose any of the three viral genes, so it's not defective. That's why he was lucky, because everyone after him that identified these viruses in, from chickens all got defective viruses. What, that means you need a helper virus together with a defective virus to grow it up. Otherwise, you'll never see it. So here's, for example, avian myeloblastosis, a different kind of tuber. You see it's lost some envelope sequence. You know, a bunch of myeloblastosis tumors, another sarcoma virus, has got a gene inserted. Most of the viral genes are missing. So each of these are different tumors that arose in mice that were previously infected with ALV. They're all derived from ALV. They've picked up different cellular oncogenes with these names. SARC was the first one. Then there's MIB, MIC, MIL, YES, HERB, REL, etc. And then subsequently, people started doing this with mammalian transducing retroviruses. You could do similar experiments now, not in chickens, but in mice and other mammals. So here's a murine leukemia virus and a variety of derivatives that have gained transforming potential. And they've also picked up cellular genes. These are, again, oncogenes from the cell with these weird names. And you can see most of them are defective. There's, this, there's a simian one here. There's a cat sarcoma virus here, et cetera. So we can do this in many different species. So there's some commonality. And the commonality is these are picking up genes from the cell as you will see, that are involved in growth control. Defective versus non-defective explanation. Defective viruses require a helper. They're lacking one or more viral genes, so they can't replicate on their own. They're typically missing the envelope glycoprotein, of course, which is needed to make an infectious particle. Uh, so here, again, avian leukosis virus has the complete complement of genes. Rouse has an extracellular gene, so it's not defective, but avian myeloblastosis virus, BA1, has MIB, the cellular gene MIB inserted right into envelope. So envelope is broken, and this virus cannot make the proper particles. So it needs a helper virus to co-infect the cell. Rouse would never have figured that out. And so that's why he was lucky that he got one that wasn't defective. Now, you may be wondering, how does a retrovirus capture a cellular gene? It's very simple. As you remember, retroviral DNA made by reverse transcription of the RNA genome integrates within the host cell, if it, say, integrates next to a proto-oncogene. This is a gene in the cell that controls growth. I think oncogene is an unfortunate name because it's not there to cause tumors, but its dysregulation can lead to the transformation and production of tumors. So here we have an integrated virus, a provirus. It's making wild-type mRNA. There may, in some cases, be aberrant recombination events that remove the three prime LTR. Remember, the transcription termination signal is within the three prime LTR. So a recombination event may lead to the deletion. These happen in genomes all the time. Now the message that is made from the provirus keeps going. And if there's a neighboring oncogene, it'll incorporate those sequences into the mRNA. That'll be packaged in the virus particle. And even if there's only one copy of the RNA, Copy choice during reverse transcription may eventually lead to the incorporation of the oncogene into the virus particle. And then it will be delivered to a new cell where it'll be overproduced. So we think that the capture of these cellular genes, their overproduction in a retrovirus contact can lead to cellular transformation. And in some cases, we see that in the reproduction cycles of these viruses, mutations are sustained in the oncogenes that actually increase their transformation potential. 
Now in the cell, as I said, there are very many genes that are captured by these transducing retroviruses. In the cell, we call them proto-oncogenes to signify that there they don't have oncogenic potential. Uh, there are over 60 that have been identified by studying these transforming or transducing retroviruses, and all of them control cell growth. They're highly regulated in the cell because cells are not dividing all the time, and only when cells need to divide are these genes turned on. And the normal cellular genes have abbreviations with a C in front of them, like C SARC, C MYC, etc. And the ret when the retroviruses pick up a copy of them, we call them V something. V onks, V SARC, V MYC, etc. So these are genes involved in the control of the cell cycle. And here's a, a picture of where all of these proto oncogenes are. The people have said they encode oncoproteins. And here's a cell and all of these gene products. Again, these are genes picked up by retroviruses that can transform chicken cells or mammalian cells. These are all genes involved in the control of cell growth. And you can see this pathway starts at, this, at the plasma membrane. There are receptors on the plasma membrane for growth factors. Those receptors are encoded by genes that were discovered because they're picked up by transforming retroviruses, Herb, FIMS, KIT, ROS, SCA. Even the growth factors themselves are oncogenes, proto-oncogenes. They can be picked up by retroviruses. And the way this pathway works is growth factors will bind receptors. A signaling pathway will be initiated that eventually leads to the production of transcriptional regulators in the nucleus, which turn on the genes needed for cell division and DNA synthesis. And all along the way, all the genes involved in this pathway are proto-oncogenes identified by studying retroviruses. Here, there are uh, proteins on the inner surface of the membrane, membrane brown protein kinases that are the first step in transducing the signal. And SARC is one of those. RAS is a G protein involved in the signaling. There's cytoplasmic protein kinases and finally nuclear transcription factors. So again, all of these genes were identified in retroviruses that pick them up and become transforming. So they identified this entire regulatory pathway of cell growth. Maybe we would have gotten to it eventually, but viruses showed the way in identifying this pathway. So remember, these viruses transform cells in culture. The virus makes them divide forever. And they do so by delivering these cellular genes, which are normally highly regulated. The virus delivers them in an unregulated fashion, sometimes in a mutated fashion, and their production causes the cells to divide forever. There is no longer any control over cell growth. So let's take a look at the cell uh, division pathway. Here's the cell cycle, of course. Cells go through mitosis, then they go through a G1 phase, a synthesis phase where DNA is made, and then a preparatory G2 before division. And at this very top, at the G0 part, just before mitosis, there is a checkpoint where the cell has to decide whether it's going to go on to mitosis. And those signals, those are called mitogenic signals, were revealed by studying these transforming retroviruses. Those are all those genes in that pathway from the cell surface, from growth factors in the medium all the way down into the nucleus. They control whether the cell is going to go through mitosis, and they were discovered in transforming retroviruses. We call them dominant oncogenes because you just put one copy of them in a cell, and the cell will start dividing. It'll divide forever. It is transformed. It is now immortal. So we have since identified three different ways that retroviruses transform cells. Some cause rapid tumor formation, like Rouse sarcoma virus. It'll cause a tumor in a chicken in about two weeks. You infect the chicken with the virus. It contain, the virus contains a dominant oncogene. The protein is made immediately as the virus replicates, and that turns on the mitogenic pathway of the cell. We have viruses with intermediate kinetics of tumor formation, like ALV. Avian leukosis virus causes leukemia. It takes months to do so. It doesn't carry an oncogene. ALV has no oncogene in its genome. Rather, it integrates next to one and turns on the oncogene in cis. It doesn't pick it up, sits next to it, and it takes a bit longer for that to drive the cell into transformation. And finally, we have viruses with slow kinetics, like human T-cell 
Le leukemia virus takes years to cause cancers in people. There's no dominant oncogene in these viruses. It does not cause cis activation. It doesn't integrate next to an oncogene, but rather the virus genome encodes a regulatory protein, a transcriptional regulatory protein that's needed for uh, transcription of viral genes, and that regulatory protein also activates the transcription of cellular oncogenes by accident. They happen to have a similar transcriptional regulatory reason. So they take years and years to develop tumors. So here are three diagrams of these three different kinds of transforming retroviruses. The rapid ones where the virus picks up the oncogene, it's integrated in the viral genome and delivered to a new cell, Rouse sarcoma virus. The intermediate length, like ALV, cis-activating. There's no oncogene in the viral genome, but the provirus integrates next to a C-onc, turns it on by virtue of transcription from that right-handed LTR. Remember, there's a promoter there as well. And then finally, the trans-activating, slow-acting, transforming retroviruses. The viral genome encodes a transcriptional activator here called X needed for transcription of the viral gene, but it will turn on a cellular gene, for example, IL-2 and its receptor, and that will cause cells to proliferate, in particular T cells. So back to our exception. I said at the beginning, no virus requires transformation or the formation of a tumor for its reproduction. And as I said, someone emailed me a few years ago and said, you can't say that because there is a fish retrovirus. It's called walleye dermal sarcoma virus. It causes these tumors in fish. This is a walleye fish. And every year they develop these tumors. The fish is fine. The tumor is caused by virus replicating in the cells of the fish. And in the fall, as the weather gets cold, the tumor falls off. And that spreads the virus in the water so it can infect the new fish. So without the tumor, the virus can't find a new host. So that's the only example I know where transformation and tumor Induction is actually required for virus replication. I'm sure there'll be more, but in, at least in mammals, in humans, this is not the case. We, there is no obvious requirement for transforming the cell or causing cancers. And as you'll see, you'll understand at the end why that's the case. Our second question is, which of the following allows Rouse sarcoma virus to transform cells? Presence of the envelope gene, presence of a Paul gene, presence of a SARC gene, presence of LTRs, none of the above. Most of you got C, which is the correct answer. Presence of a SARC gene is what allows Rouse sarcoma virus to transform cells. Not the envelope, not Paul, not LTRs. It's the SARC gene which transforms the cells, right? The SARC gene is a cellular regulatory protein that is highly regulated. If it's not, it makes the cells divide. When the virus delivers it, the cells divide. All right, so that's uh, the story that we learned from RNA tumor viruses. Let's go to DNA tumor viruses here, uh, which led in 1959 to studies with polyomaviruses, and they converged because they told us similar things as well. So DNA tumor viruses uh, were first discovered in 1933 by Richard Shope, who was a virologist also working at the Rockefeller Medical Institute. He actually isolated influenza virus way back in the early 30s. And then he was interested in um, viruses that cause warts in rabbits. And he isolated a papillomavirus that does that. So these are rabbits in the wild with warts. These are warts growing on their faces and their head. If you've ever heard of the jackalope, look it up on the internet. There's a whole Wikipedia page. A jackalope is a mythical creature, which is a rabbit with antlers. It's probably rabbits with papillomas, like this one, because these can grow out of the head as well as the nose. And although they look scary, they fall off and the rabbits are OK. But they're caused by a DNA tumor virus that Richard Shope identified in 1933. And this is uncontrolled cell proliferation caused by the virus. That's, that's essentially what a wart is. It's your cells and your skin proliferating uncontrollably and forming that lump. In the case of these, they're very big. Uh, in 1953, another uh, similar virus discovered by Ludwig Gross, murine polyomaviruses, mouse polyomaviruses. They cause tumors under certain conditions. So the natural host of these viruses is the mouse. 
but they have no role in mouse cancer. They don't cause cancer in mice. They will make tumors in other animals, hamsters, rats, and rabbits, but not in mice. And this is an important point here, which we're going to come back to. So the name polyomavirus, by the way, comes from the fact that these induce many tissues, polyomas. And SV40 is a polyomavirus, and SV40 is a virus of primates. This was discovered in uh, 1962 as a contaminant of the early poliovirus vaccines, which were grown in monkey kidney cultures, primary cell cultures produced from monkeys. And we didn't know about SV40 being there. It was discovered, but not before several million Americans got it. We have since removed SV40 from the polio vaccines. And, and we don't believe that it caused any tumors in humans. But if you look this up, you will find lots of stories online about SV40 causing human tumors. But I don't think there's, there's good evidence that they have. So this virus is from uh, primates. The natural host is the monkeys. But again, it doesn't cause tumors in monkeys. It will cause tumors in other animals, but not in monkeys. And it does not transform monkey cells and culture. So we're starting to see a little pattern here. And this summarizes what I've told you so far. Here we have the response of different cells to infection. Here on the left is the species. So the monkey is permissive for SV40. The mouse polyoma virus in monkeys, non-permissive. Virus does not replicate at all. So no tumors are formed by SV40 or mouse polyoma viruses in monkeys. In the mouse, SV40 is non-permissive. Of course, mouse polyoma is fully permissive, that's the natural host. No tumors caused by these viruses in mice. If you infect hamsters with either SV40 or mouse polyomavirus, the infection is semi-permissive and leads to the formation of tumors. That's the red asterisk. Semi-permissive means we only get through the early phase of the cycle. Remember, we divided the polyomavirus reproduction cycle into early and late. Semi-permissive means only early gene expression happens, not late gene expression. Similarly, if you infect rats or rat cells with SV40 or mouse polyomavirus, these are semi-permissive cells for these viruses, and tumors will result in the animal or transform cells in culture. So you see the pattern here. If the cell is permissive or non-permissive, no tumors are found. Only when we have semi-permissive conditions do we get tumor formation. This kind of transformation in cell culture, anyway, is pretty rare. You get one transformed cell per 100,000 if you would infect, say, a mouse cell with a different polyomavirus other than a mouse polyomavirus. It's very rare. And the question is why and how does this relate to rare tumor formation in animals? It's also rare in animals. Another family of DNA tumor viruses is the adenoviruses. And these we've also talked about quite a bit in this course. There are many human serotypes, but none of them cause cancer in humans. Uh, serotypes 12 through 18 will cause tumors in hamsters, right, the wrong host. 7 to 11 was tumorigenic, is poorly tumorigenic, so we have quite a few serotypes causing tumors in hamsters. But again, these are very rare events. Transformation of cells and culture by these viruses, very rare. Transformation or causing tumors in animals, very rare. And it's always when it's the wrong host. Adenovirus does not cause tumors in human cells, and humans are the natural host of human adenoviruses. So what is going on here? Well, many people were working on all of these viruses over the years, the polyomaviruses, uh, the adenoviruses, even the papillomaviruses, and they found one very important thing. These virus-infected cells all contain some kind of a T or tumor antigen in them. And you remember we talked about the T antigen of SV40 because it's involved in DNA replication, transcriptional regulation, hugely multifunctional protein. There it is at the top right, and all the things that it binds to. Polyomaviruses also encode three different kinds of T antigens. The papillomaviruses that cause warts, they, cause, they encode T antigens. They're encoded by genes called E5, E6, and E7. And the adenoviruses also encode T antigens. They're encoded by the E1A and E1B genes. They're called T antigens because they were first found in tumors. The only viral proteins that you could consistently find in tumors or transformed cells 
caused by infection with these viruses. And they're all different. The SV40, the polyoma, the adeno, the papilloma, T antigens, they're all different proteins. This is the SV40 T antigen at the top here. So what's going on here? You remember that these are essential viral genes, they're, these T antigens. They're needed for replication, transcription, they're needed for viral DNA synthesis. And as I've said, they're the only viral genes that are always retained in tumors or transformed cells. And sometimes they're the only viral gene that you find when you say infect a cell with adenovirus and it becomes transformed. And now we know that you can take these genes by themselves. We can clone SV40T antigen, the papillomavirus T antigen, the adeno E1A, B. We can clone them on a plasmid and introduce those into cells and make the cells immortal. If you want to immortalize yourself, you can take some cells from your cheek, put them in culture, add SV40T antigen, and they will outlive you. So you'll have to have someone take care of them for you or freeze them. But you can immortalize any cell line by adding these T antigens. And that's, of course, a key to their transforming cells. Now, people first found that T antigens of these viruses were always in these transformed cells in tumors. And then they made three incredibly important discoveries, which are shown here, that made us understand how these proteins transformed cells. First, it was found that a 53 kilodalton protein in the cell could bind T antigen. And this is now the famous P53 protein. So it was found initially because it bound SV40T antigen. Secondly, the adenovirus early genes, the E2 genes, which we talked about earlier, they require a cell protein called E2F, a transcription factor from the cell called E2F. And third, E2F was also found to bind a cellular protein called RB, the retinoblastoma protein. This protein was discovered in young children who have eye tumors. And as you'll see, it plays an important role in transformation. These are all critical players in normal control of the cell cycle, P53, RB, and E2F transcription factors. So here's the cell cycle again in a larger context. We have actual cell division or mitosis taking up the middle. But of course, before you can do mitosis, uh, the, the cell has to grow, the DNA has to replicate, and only then do you divide into two cells. This, is, as I've already told you, is under very strict control because you do not want cells growing or dividing uncontrollably. That is a recipe to sustain mutations which will lead to cancers. So the beginning of the cell cycle is up here. Uh, this is G0, and when you stimulate cells to divide, they will go around the cell cycle and replicate. And as I said, these are controlled at the beginning by the oncogenes that we talked about, and as you'll see in a moment, by this restriction point in G1. Whether or not the cells go through this cell cycle is determined by the concentration of nutrients in the medium, growth factors. If there's a good concentration, they will bind the growth factor receptors and push the cells into mitosis. They turn on a number of genes that are required for that process, DNA synthesis and cell division. So is the world rich enough to replicate the cell? And all these proteins that are involved in that decision, which act right up here, are the proto-oncogenes discovered in transforming retroviruses. But there's another restriction point down here that will stop cell division if conditions are not right. And that restriction point is determined by this protein called the retinoblastoma or the RB protein. And as I said, this was discovered in children who develop retinal tumors. And you have to have both copies of the gene gone in these children, and they will develop a retinal tumor by age five. Those cells that develop into tumors are gone after that, so you only see these tumors in young children. But they were found to have a deletion of both copies of this gene. The protein was called RB. No one knew what it did until people started studying transforming DNA tumor viruses and found that P53 binds to RB. And you'll see how that works in a moment. RB is a recessive oncogene because the protein is a tumor suppressor. Remember, the oncogenes of retroviruses are dominant oncogenes because you add them to a cell and it will transform them. Normally, RB is present in the cell. If you take them away, it will transform the cell. 
And again, it controls passage past this restriction point. If the cell has entered G1 and something's not right about conditions, it could be nutrient concentrations or unscheduled DNA synthesis, like viral DNA synthesis, RB can stop replication. How does all this work at the molecular level? So on the left is the pathway by which growth factors turn on mitosis. So here is a cell plasma membrane. We have a growth factor receptor, and a growth factor will bind it. Remember, these are all encoded by proto-oncogenes discovered in retroviruses. So the growth factor binds its receptor, and then we have a series of signaling events, a signal transduction cascade. All these proteins, SHC, GRB2, RAS, they're all oncogenes discovered in retroviruses. Uh, these signal into the nucleus, eventually leading to the phosphorylation of RB, and that causes the G1S transition. That pushes the cells into mitosis. So that's how all those transforming retroviruses transform cells, by delivering components of these pathways to the cell. And ultimately, RB is phosphorylated, so it no longer can act as a checkpoint and stop the cell cycle. So how RB works is shown at the right. We've seen some of this before. RB is typically complexed to a series of proteins in the cell which are transcription factors, E2F and DP. These transcription factors are needed to turn on the genes required for mitosis. You need them for cell growth, you need them for DNA replication, there's a whole family of genes that are needed for the cell to divide. When RB is present, it's a checkpoint protein, it's bound to these two proteins. It recruits a histone deacetylase to the promoters, and that turns them off. The removal of acetyl groups from chromatin turns off the promoters. So in the presence of RB, these genes required for mitosis, you can see at the lower right, these genes are shut off. When RB is phosphorylated, which occurs when there are growth factors present, RB pops off of E2F, the HDACs go away from the, trend, from the promoter of the genes, and all these genes are turned on, you get DNA synthesis, you get mitosis. So that's how RB regulates the passage through the cell cycle, by uh, recruiting, basically, and hiding these transcription factors. So that's great in a cell to regulate its division, but remember, DNA viruses require cells to be in mitosis because it's only during that time that the cell is making the proteins that are needed for DNA replication. So as I told you a while ago, these DNA viruses like SV40 uh, and adenoviruses and others, they have to kick the cells into division. If they're not already dividing when they infect them, the viruses have to make them divide. They have to push them past this restriction point. And that is exactly what T antigens do. SV40, polyoma, adenovirus T antigens, they all make the cell divide if it's not already dividing. And here's how it works. It all starts with, again, RB. RB is turning off genes needed for DNA synthesis and mitosis by being bound to a E2F transcription factor, recruiting histone deacetylases so the promoter is deacetylated and shut off. These tumor viruses get into cells. They infect cells. They make T antigens. The T antigen is this little purple eggplant here, E1A, large T, E7. The T antigen binds RB. It moves it away from E2F. Same thing as phosphorylation of RB does. It takes it away from E2F, but here it's a viral protein that is mimicking it. Now E2F and DP are free to bind and activate promoters of genes involved in DNA synthesis and mitosis. That is how these DNA viruses start the cells in division. They need to do it because they need DNA polymerase and accessory factors. They're not doing it to transform cells. They're doing it because they need DNA replication machinery. By the way, and this is just a cool thing that makes you realize how beautiful viruses are, transcription of adenovirus, the E2 unit, also requires E2F. So by Putting in this T antigen, adenovirus is freeing up um, the E2F protein, not only so the cell starts to divide, but it can activate its own promoters. This one protein is doing two different things. But that's not the whole story. One more thing has to happen. 
So DNA viruses have gotten into cells. They've kicked them into division. But there's another protein in cells, which I've already mentioned, P53. If P53 detects unscheduled DNA synthesis or DNA damage, which all can be a consequence of viral DNA replication, it says, no dice. This is not happening. There are actually a series of other proteins that detect unscheduled DNA synthesis or DNA damage. They will signal to P53, which forms a multimer. It binds to promoters of genes that will then turn on cell cycle arrest and eventually program cell death. So think about it. The DNA virus gets into a cell. It's T antigen, frees up E2F, so the cell cycle begins. P53 says, uh-uh, this DNA is not scheduled. It's not happening on my guard. It will kill the cell rather than allow unscheduled DNA synthesis or damaged DNA to replicate. So it's a second guard against the cell cycle going when things aren't right. So viruses have to counter it. Otherwise, they would never replicate. It's not enough to just push the cells through the cell cycle with the T antigen. They have to take care of P53. And amazingly, the T antigens can do that too. And they all do it slightly differently. Here is, for example, here, here is P53, the purple protein. Uh, the adenovirus proteins, E1B, and another adenovirus protein, uh, they direct P53 to the proteasome so it can get degraded. Papillomavirus E6 proteins do the same thing. They cause degradation of P53. SV40 large T simply sequesters P53 so it can't bind to promoters and turn on genes that cause cell death. What else do we have here? We, we also have sequestration of uh, P53, which inhibits the transcription of genes that are needed for apoptosis and cell cycle arrest. So the T antigens not only kick the cell into cell division, they also block P53, so it can't sense that DNA replication is happening unscheduled, and they prevent programmed cell death. So now I think you're understanding why cell transformation is occurring, but there are a couple of pieces we have to answer before we get that complete understanding. But first, here's our last question. T antigens are A, encoded by viral genes that are essential for replication, B, present in tumors and transformed cells, C, encoded by viral genes that have been incorporated into the cell genome, D, antagonists of cell cycle checkpoint proteins, or all of the above? The answer is all of the above, which most of you got. Every one of those points is correct. There are encoded by viral genes that are essential for replication. They're present in tumors and transformed cells. Sometimes they're the only viral protein present. They're encoded by viral genes that have been incorporated in the cell genome, and they are antagonists of cell cycle checkpoint proteins. All right, two more things that I, we have to explain to really put this whole story together. Uh, first, why are all the viral genes except the T antigen genes gone or turned off? in cells transformed by these viruses, and why is transformation so rare? And uh, the answer is because there are two low probability events that have to occur for transformation to occur. Late, late genes cannot be expressed because they're typically lethal. If you remember the SV40 transcriptional program, the early genes include large T, which gets DNA synthesis going, and then the late genes encode mainly structural proteins to form virus particles, and that will kill the cell. So if you don't express late genes, the cell will survive. And that's the same case with the other viruses that transform cells, the other DNA tumor viruses. So how do you prevent the late genes from being expressed? Well, sometimes when a virus infects a cell, the late genes might be deleted. Spontaneous deletions, that happens with DNA often. So that could get rid of them, or you infect semi-permissive hosts. Remember that table I showed you earlier? The cells that are semi-permissive are the ones that are transformed when they're infected with viruses from the wrong species, and that's why they're semi-permissive. The virus is coming from another species. And semi-permissive means we don't go through the late cycle, and that's why the late genes are not expressed. All right, so that's one rare event. The second is that you have to make T antigen all the time, and all the daughter cells have to inherit it. And the way to do that, of course, is to integrate the T antigen coding sequences into host DNA. 
And so that's a rare event also. Just imagine SV40 infects a cell. The T antigen DNA only has to integrate into the host genome and be continuously produced because as soon as you turn off T antigen, the cells no longer transform because it's the T antigen that's pushing the cell through the cell cycle. So that's why transformation is rare and that's why tumor formation is rare because of these two very rare events that have to occur. So I hope I have convinced you that transformation and tumor formation are rare events. They are abnormal epigenetic processes for these DNA tumor viruses is in quotes. That's what they were called when they were first discovered to cause tumors. They're not really tumor viruses. To forming a tumor or transforming cells is absolutely not required for virus reproduction. They're not required for the normal life cycle or transmission. And what's amazing is that these effects were discovered by infecting the wrong hosts with these viruses. Took a human adenovirus and put it into different animal hosts and they got these effects. And so it, it just goes to show you that if you propose an experiment and someone says, it's a crazy experiment, it doesn't make any sense, you should do it anyway. Because what do they know? It might turn out to be a good result in the end. Now, I have told you that these viruses cause transformation in tumors when you infect the wrong host. We now understand that sometimes even in the right host, viruses can cause tumors. And an example are the human papillomaviruses, which mostly cause warts in humans, but in some cases, certain serotypes can cause tumors of various types. And those viruses encode a T antigen. And it's the continuous expression of that T antigen, which occurs as an accident when the viral genome integrates into the host cellular genome and the T antigen is constitutively produced, that is causing transformation. That is what happened to Henrietta Lacks. She was infected by a human papillomavirus back in the late 40s. It apparently integrated into her DNA and the expression of T antigen caused the formation of the cervical tumor which eventually killed her but which gave rise to HeLa cells, which we still have today. How do we know this? because about five years ago, the HeLa cell genome was sequenced, and there is human papillovirus T antigen sitting right in her DNA. So we know exactly what caused uh, her tumor. And by the way, if she were alive today, vaccination with HPV vaccine would have saved her life. So uh, this tumor formation for DNA tumor viruses is a epiphenomena of a unique reproductive cycle. So DNA tumor viruses have to start the cell cycle to make DNA. So T antigens do that and get the cells going by inhibiting RB. They inactivate P53 to block apoptosis. That allows the cells to make the DNA synthesis machinery that the virus needs. Uh, but if the lytic events are modulated, which as we said happens in the wrong host, then the cells are transformed. They're not gonna die, they're gonna live forever because they keep dividing, and eventually they will become cancer cells. These transformed cells, as such, are not necessarily oncogenic. As I said in the beginning, they have to sustain additional mutations before they will become a cancer, and that will happen as they divide incessantly, and at each cell division, mutations sustain in the genome, and you get the right ones in about 12 different genes, then that transformed cell becomes a cancer. So this whole understanding of how cell, how cell division is regulated, all of it comes from the study of RNA and DNA tumor viruses. The transformation by RNA tumor viruses, the integration into host DNA, discovered the proto-oncogenes, the dominant oncogenes that turn on mitosis, the DNA tumor viruses that turn on the cell cycle and also suppress the checkpoint down here via this recessive oncogenes. This whole cell cycle control, all the details came about because of our study of RNA and DNA tumor viruses, and in particular, viruses that do not cause tumors in humans. These were viruses that caused tumors in experimental animals. Because of that, we now understand how other viruses was cancers. Another reason why we have to study what seem like odd experimental systems, we don't have to study only humans. We can study other systems to get insight into human diseases. Try explaining that to a politician who's controlling 
your grant funds. It's very hard to explain why we should study mouse cancer and not just human cancer. But here it is, right here. That explains it. The most amazing thing about this story, it all started with a chicken and the desire to understand how tumors arose in that chicken by Dr. Rouse. I think it's a great story. So next time, we will start to talk about how to prevent and resolve virus infections. We will start with vaccines. <laughs>